Shalom, Izzy here with Holy Language Institute, and welcome to this very first lesson in our course reading through the Besorah, the gospel, the, the good news, the message from one of Yeshua's closest disciples, Yohanan, or John. And you can see the title of this here, Ha Besorah Ha Kedosha. So in this translation, it includes the word, you you know, kadosh, right? To be holy or uh, special. So the holy gospel, the holy message. All P, uh, all is on. And then P is the pat of the mouth of Yochanan. I'm really excited about reading through this gospel with you. There are quite a few stories and teachings in the writings of Yochanan that aren't in the other three Gospels. So it's going to be very special. I'm, as, we, as we read, I'm also going to um, introduce you to some commentaries from a couple of the greatest Christian Hebraists of all time. As you probably know, a Christian Hebraist is a Christian Hebrew scholar, someone who um, has studied Hebrew and is usually also acquainted with uh, traditional Jewish literature. I'll show you right now the two commentators that I will be primarily drawing from. Um, The first is a four-volume series. I'll show it to you here. Commentary on the New Testament from the Talmud and Hebraica by John Lightfoot. Um, He was the greatest Christian Hebraist of the 1600s. And I will show you a picture of him too. Let's see if we can skip over to John Lightfoot. So, I really like his... Uh, there are quite a few things about him that are, that are notable. His hair and his eyes and his garb being included amongst those things. If you want to learn a little bit more about him, I, uh, I suggest just Google him and, and you can read more. One notable thing about John Lightfoot is that um, the Jews were allowed back into England in the middle of his lifetime. And he may have had something to do with that. Um, If you're familiar with Jewish history, then you may know that the Jewish people were kicked out of almost every country in Europe at one time or another. Um, The most infamous of those edicts was the expulsion from Spain, which roughly coincided with uh, the, the flight of Christopher Columbus across the ocean and his discovery of the New World. And it is highly probable that those two events were connected with each other, by the way. But at other times in Jewish history, um, the Jewish people were treated as unwelcome. And you know, there, was, there was a time when the Jewish people were kicked out of England, which is kind of tough considering that England was an island. Like, how do you get off an island? Anyway, so they were, there were basically no Jews in England for hundreds of years. And it was halfway through the lifetime of John Lightfoot um, that that changed. So, not going to go into all the history of that, but it was definitely a notable event. And he wrote uh, he wrote some of the earliest uh, commentary on the New Testament that factored in traditional Jewish literature from the uh, the Jewish world of Jesus and the authors of the New Testament. Um, the second person that I'd like to introduce you to is the man behind. This 10-volume series, uh, an exposition of the Old and New Testaments. As you can see, this is Volume 7, Matthew to John, and it was done by John Gill. And I'll show you a picture of him in the um, in the opening pages here. And it also it also shows when he lived. So there's Dr. John Gill, who lived from 1960, uh, 1697 to 1771. Definitely the greatest Christian Hebraist of the 1700s. And there's some crossover between uh, these two commentaries, but they're they're very rich, and uh, I'll, I'll sometimes refer. I'll just read you quotes from them, or I will uh, use. I'll, I'll I'll refer to some of the uh, traditional Jewish literature that they cite in their commentaries, and uh, you can get both of these for free in digital format on eSword, by the way. So if if you're interested in learning more about that, check out our eSword course at holylanguage.com and uh, I kind of take you step by step and show you how to use eSword for uh, both your computer and your phone 
and I show you how to get the commentaries of the great Christian Hebraists, such as John uh, Lightfoot from the 1600s and John Gill from the 1700s. So I think that you'll enjoy um, their contributions to our conversation, shall we say. Uh, Dr. John Gill is one of the few people that I would really like to meet and talk with in the kingdom. Um, I just, I'm really fascinated by his story. Anyways, so let's uh, continue here. We'll come back to our text of the Gospel of John. So at Holy Language Institute, our focus is on Yeshua, the person of Yeshua himself. Um, our focus is on responding to his, uh, his call. What was his original call? He said, follow me. And uh, that's still the call today. And that's our focus on, on Yeshua himself, on following him. And doing so, um, we like to say, in a Hebrew way. That doesn't mean becoming Jewish. doesn't necessarily even mean in a Jewish way. But it means we're encountering the, the Messiah through the Hebrew language. We're, we're coming to know Yeshua more closely through um, delving into the... Uh, it's almost like we're, we're, we're stepping back into the Jewish world of Yeshua and his disciples. We're encountering the King of the Jews through the language of his Jewish people. And that's definitely going to be our focus in uh, the, this Gospel of John course as we read verse by verse through it. This is a translation done, by the way, by the greatest Christian Hebraist of the 1800s, Professor Franz Delich. And uh, we, have his, we have his story out in a multi-chaptered series, so to speak, and uh, you may be interested in, in learning more about him. Definitely. Um, Hearing the story of Professor Franz Delich will give you a, uh, a deeper appreciation for uh, the, the beauty and, and, and deep meaning and, and passion behind, uh, behind this translation. So, having said that, let's, uh, let's start reading together with a focus on um, Yeshua himself and uh, doing what he said was the greatest commandment in the Gospel of Mark chapter 12. He was asked, what's the greatest commandment? And he said, Shema Yisrael. He said, Hear, O Israel. And he quoted that passage from the book of Deuteronomy. So what is, uh, what is our focus as we read? Our, our focus is on Shemoying and on hearing. And for that reason, I'm not even going to open this study session with a prayer. If you want to uh, go ahead and pause this lesson and, and pray, or even just pause for a moment and just take a deep breath and open your heart, feel free to do that. But I don't even want my words to be on par with Scripture, so to speak. I just want us to focus on, on Shemoying together. Shemoing as we kara, the Hebrew word for to read is kara, that also means to cry out, to preach, and to pray. So so the act of reading scripture itself is, is an act of prayer and uh, it's also an act of preaching. So let us let us let us proceed therefore in a in, in a prayerful mindset and also preach the word to each other because the, the word of God is powerful and it is life giving to our spirits. B Reshit. So, ba in reshit, the beginning. We'll look at a verse that this parallels in just a moment. Haya was ha devar, was the devar, the word. And um, before we go any further, let's look at Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, because of course these really quite closely parallel each other as I'm sure you, you noticed. Right, so this is Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. And you can see here, we have the same, the same opening, Bereshit, in the beginning, and then the next two words, Bara, created, Elohim, God. And then we have a word that isn't actually translated into English because it's, it, it serves a grammatical uh, function that we don't have in the English language, and so it's just, it's just left silent, so to speak. It's an untranslated word. And interestingly enough, it's actually used twice in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. It's used here, and then it's also used here. So it's used before Hashemim, the heavens, and it's used before Haaretz, the earth. So Bereshit, in the beginning, bara created Elohim, God, this word... Hashemim, the heavens, and this word, 
and the earth. Yeah, grammatically speaking, it you have you have the you have this you have the the subject, so the the person or thing who's who's doing this stuff, and then you have the object, the person or thing to whom the stuff is being done. Let's let's put it that way. And uh, this little word, at, precedes the uh, the direct object in the sentence. So here you have the subject Elohim, God. Here you have uh, what he's doing. He's barring. He's loosely speaking. He's creating, and then what is being created, at, Hashemim. What else is being created? The at, Haaretz, the earth. So that's that's how it works. Now what's interesting about this word is it's spelled Aleph and Tav. It's spelled with the first and last letters of the Hebrew alphabet. The Greek equivalent would would have it being spelled Alpha and Omega, just in the sense of it being the the uh, the first and the last letters of the alphabet. And uh, interestingly enough, you know, you, you, in, in, the, in the Greek New Testament, we have Yeshua saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega. In the Hebrew, we have him saying, I am the Aleph and the Tav. Well, what's interesting about that? It's a word. And what's interesting is it's actually true of, of what he does in our lives. So here we have God doing something through the Aleph and Tav, through the At. He's making the heavens, and through the olive and tov, through the at, he's making the earth. All right. So, I, I delve into this in greater detail in the Hebrew quest, our Hebrew quest lessons, where we where we actually go through this chapter. This was just a really quick overview. There there are depths of meaning here that I haven't even touched on. Um, wow, like mind-boggling secrets that are contained in just the Hebrew text of Genesis one one. So, do Hebrew quest if you haven't yet. Um, it's not like you have to do one or the other in order, but indefinitely, you know, our Hebrew verses lessons are something of an extension of Hebrew quest. All right. So having said that, let's go back now to John chapter one. And we see here him saying, Breshit, in the beginning, Haya was what? Was the word. Well, let's go back now to Genesis chapter one. In the beginning was literally was this little word, the, the Aleph and Tav, the Alpha and the Omega. There, in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning was this word. This word represents Messiah. He said, I am the Aleph and Tav. In the beginning was the Aleph and Tav. Vehadavar, and the word, Haya, was Aleph and Tav. There is our word, at. Now, why, why did, uh, did Delich use, use this word here? In the beginning was the word, and the word was with Ha Elohim. So with with literally the God or with the Almighty. Et can also mean with, and and so this this is a good usage of the word. So the, the, there can you see that there are, there are two meanings here. There's the, the the there's the literal meaning in this translation, which is probably this is probably what Yochanan, who of course was a Hebrew speaking Jew. You know, he, he read the Torah in Hebrew. He prayed the traditional Jewish prayers in Hebrew. Did he speak only Hebrew? No. Uh, definitely he also spoke Aramaic. But Hebrew and Aramaic were kind of mixed together in his time. So it's not like it was either or, right? So definitely, you know, here we have Yochanan, this, 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 um, this, this Hebrew of Hebrew, so to speak. And definitely he had this in his mind. So, Hadavar, the word Haya, was at, was with the Almighty. And... How can this also be read? The Devar was the Aleph and Tav of the Almighty. And, and both are true. All right. The Elohim and God, Haya, was Ha Deval, the Word. Let's read the next verse and then we're going to talk about where Yochanan got this idea from and if there were, if, if, if this was totally new to his hearers or what they would have been. Uh, what they would have been connecting this with in their mind. Who? That's he. Haya was the Reshit. He was in the beginning at Ha Elohim. So he was in the beginning. He was in, in the book of Genesis, the, the Aleph and Tav of the Almighty, but more literally, he was in the beginning with God. Now, why else is this notable? Yeshua said, I'm, in the, I'm the Aleph and Tav, and the Aleph and Tav means what? Well, it precedes the um, the uh, the direct object, grammatically speaking. 
So it indicates who or what is getting the re receiving the action, having the stuff done done to them, so to speak. But it also means with. Does that tell you something about Yeshua? Yes, Yeshua is the one who was and is with the Father. Yeshua is the one who said at the end of the Gospel of Matthew before his Aliyah, his ascension, what did he say? I am I am with you always. I am Olaf and Tov. I'm with you always. So isn't that special? It's very special to me. All right, and I'm sure it is to you too. All right. Now let's let's take this now let's take this a little bit further. This whole concept of the word who was with God and the word who was God and then later on he's going to say and the word became flesh and he uh, he lived with us. We're going to we're going to do have a little little history lesson here. So you you remember the Jewish people were exiled to Babylon roughly 2500 years ago. And then roughly 7 70 years after that, some of the Jewish people came back to Israel from Babylon and they uh they eventually they rebuilt the temple, rebuilt Jerusalem and uh reconstituted the uh the country of Israel. And uh one of the uh the big players in that, that saga was Ezra, the scribe. If you've read the books of Ezra and Nehemiah, then you know, you know that story. So by the time the Jewish people came back from Babylon, they, they had picked up uh, Aramaic as, a, as, a, as another language. So the Jewish people coming back from Babylon spoke both Hebrew and Aramaic. And in fact, for many of them, Aramaic was their, was their first language. You know, they, they were born in Babylon, they grew up there. And so Aramaic was the, the language that they, they needed to learn to get around. And uh, Ezra, Ezra, in the book of Ezra, it's, it's, there's a story told of how they would, they would read the Torah publicly to the people. And they wouldn't just read it in Hebrew because not everybody understood it. What they would do is they would read the Torah in Hebrew and then they would translate as they went. And uh, they wouldn't just give a literal word for word translation they would explain the text they would they would give the meaning of the uh, of the scriptures and uh that was actually a a custom that was started in that time period that was carried on throughout the second temple era so synagogues you know it was it was it was under the leadership of Ezra that the whole synagogue system was developed where you you go somewhere on every saturday morning and you you read the torah and uh, and you pray together and and you do these things, and uh, that that was in my opinion I think that was a great that was a great uh, innovation. Now in the synagogues it wasn't just the the Hebrew Torah scroll that was read. There was also a translator who was called a metergamon, and the metergamon would uh, would 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 explain what was being read to make sure that everybody understood it. So a verse would be read in Hebrew, then the metergamon would translate it into their language and not just translate, like I said, word for word, but interpret it, give the sense, give the sense of uh, what was being spoken of. And uh, so this was, this was a, this was a custom that was started that was hundreds of years, hundreds of years old. And this is how things were done in the time of Yeshua of Nazareth and his disciples. So the, uh, the scriptures were read and, uh, and explained in both Hebrew and and Aramaic. So, here's the interesting thing. Eventually, those Aramaic translations of the Hebrew Bible were written down, and uh, they were they were codified and, and made official, basically. So, you know, originally, my, from my understanding, it was a little it was a little bit more um, like fluid, so to speak, and then eventually it was it was more codified. So the um, and and I had mentioned that a translator was called a metergamon. So a translation of the Hebrew Bible into Aramaic was called a targum. You've probably heard that word before. So the, uh, the official translation of the Torah, the five books of Moses, into Aramaic was called the targum onkelos. It's kind of a cute name, if you ask me. Targum onkelos. And then the translation of the prophets into Aramaic was known as the targum uh, Yonatan or Targum Jonathan, and uh, the guy who did that translation was his name was Yonatan Ben Uziel, Jonathan Ben Uziel, and um, the he, he didn't do the uh, he didn't do the writings. It's it's interesting to uh, 
it's interesting to read about that historical time period and why he didn't do the writings. I'm not going to get into that here. But uh, the, the, poignant, the poignant fact is Onkelos translated the Torah, Jonathan translated the prophets. And uh, Jonathan lived roughly at the same time that Yeshua uh, lived. You know, he was a disciple of Hillel, who was one of the two greatest sages when Yeshua was a little boy, along with Shammai. And, uh, and, and, and Jonathan was reputed to be an inspired individual. He was, he was inspired by the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit. And uh, in, in terms of not just how he translated, but how, but how he expounded upon the scriptures in his, uh, in his interpretations. And um, it's really interesting reading the history about him. And there's a reason. Th this, this leads into the Gospel of John, by the way, in case you're wondering, like, where am I going with this? All right. So, yeah, like, uh, Jonathan was reputed to have received a lot of the oral traditions from the, the last prophets in, in the, the, Hebrew canon, the, the Hebrew canon of Scripture, Zechariah, um, Haggai, Malachi. And so, and so it, was, it was kind of an inter a prophetic interpretation, shall we say. All right. Now, what's interesting is we still have those Targums. We still have tar the Targums of Onkelos and Jonathan. And uh, these two Targums are generally, they're, they're like the official ones. And um, they, they're often referred to as the Eastern, or Eastern Targums. So they use the Aramaic that was spoken in, um, in, in Babylonia. There are other Targums that were from that same time period that originated in the land of Israel. And um, they're... There's one group of three of them that are known as the uh, the, the, the Palestinian Targums, and then there is a gr another group of about ten that are known as the Jerusalem Targums. And uh, these ones, again, are you know they're very they're very ancient. They're, the, the Aramaic is slightly more Western, like the kind of Aramaic that was spoken in Israel versus the Aramaic that was spoken off to the east in Babylon, and um, and and they all help us to understand how was the Bible understood and interpreted by the Jewish people 2,000 years ago. Um, because as I mentioned, it, it's not just a literal word for word translation, it's an expounding. So there's a lot of uh, traditional interpretations that are that are mixed in there. And uh, it's really interesting. And I'm going to show you a couple of these, these Targums because it helps us to understand how some of these old prophecies about the Messiah, they were definitely understood by the Jewish people as being about the Messiah. Whereas Judaism today would be like, nah, no, those aren't about the Messiah. That's a Christian interpretation. It's like, no, 2,000 years ago, that was not just a Christian interpretation. That was actually an original Jewish interpretation. So we're, um, we're going to get into those. Now, okay, now here's the interesting thing. Throughout the Targums, instead of just talking, of, talking about the Lord, it frequently talked about the Word of the Lord. And I'm going to show you some instances of that because it's, it's going to help us to better understand when, when John talks about the word, he, you know, again, remember, John and everybody basically that read his gospel, if they were Jewish, they grew up going to synagogue every Saturday morning and not just hearing the Torah itself, but hearing these, um, these Targums and, 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 um, and, 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 and hearing all about, you know, specifically the word of the Lord. All right, so let's skip over. We have uh, several things here we're going to be looking at together. And uh, this is okay. This is the one I want to. This is the one I want to show you specifically. All right. So these are these are some examples from the targums that I just mentioned. I uh, th I'm just going to show you about five pages of some lo loosely interspersed instances. If you if you want all of them, I actually have a collection of all of them for you. Um, right here. This is. 123 pages of uh, places where the word of the Lord makes uh, makes his appearance in the Targums. And as you can see here, um, there's, the, there's the, the Jewish Publication Society translation of the Hebrew Bible. And it's kind of like, you know, a gold, gold standard, so to speak. And then we have Onkelos, which is the official translation of the, uh, the Pentateuch. And then we also have the... Um, we have, remember I mentioned those two collections, the Palestinian collection, which is three big ones. Um, what, one, of those, one of which came from the Cairo Geniza, by the way, in, in Egypt. And then, uh, and then also we have the, the Jerusalem collection. All right, so that's what those words there stand for. And then later on, 
when you hit the prophets like the book of Isaiah, you're also going to see J-O-N, which stands for Jonathan. So that's, you know, the official uh, Targum uh, Yonatan. All right, so anyways, I will include the download link for this document. It's 123 pages, like I said. But, you know, if you want to, if you want to look more thoroughly through these and just be absolutely blown away, then um, you are welcome to do that. So I'll include the link to these in the, uh, the the video description underneath this video for you. All right, but we're not going to uh, we're not going to do that right now. We are going to. Um, I'm just going to show you some some little instances. Oops, I think I might have just. Okay, there we go. Here, let's click this off. We're trying going to try to keep a not get too cluttered. All right, so let's let's look at some of these for ourselves. Now, before we go there, I'm just going to mention something to you. Um, so in our Hebrew translation of the Gospel of John, we encounter the word devar, which is the word for word. You'll see here that in... Um, okay, so in the Aramaic translations, it uses the word memra. Memra is the Aramaic word for word. And there is another word that's sometimes used, um, milfa, but uh, generally speaking, the word memra is the, is the one that's used in, in contexts like this. All right, so let's look at these. Genesis 127, the word of the Lord, the memra created man in his likeness. Now, remember, um, when John was writing his gospel, it would, kind of, it would kind of sound like this. In the beginning was the memra, and the memra was with God, and the memra was God. And the memra became flesh and lived amongst us. All right, so with that understanding, so the memra is the word of the Lord the word of the Lord. So the memra of Hashem created man in his likeness. A garden from the from the Eden of the just was planted by who? By the memra before the creation of the world. So again, you're like, wait a minute, that's not what it says. Exactly. That this is a targum. So it's not just a literal translation. It's also um it's also an explanation. All right, and we're actually going to encounter that idea that uh, that the, that Gan Eden, the Garden of Eden, was created before the before the world, um, like the geographical place. No, it's it's talking about a spiritual entity, anyways. But we'll encounter that a little bit later. They heard the voice of the Memra walking in the garden. The Memra called to Adam and said to him, "Remember, this is what all the Jewish people read and believed two thousand years ago when John wrote his gospel, when he said, in the beginning was the Memra." And the memra was with God, and the memra was God, right? This was like standard thought. We don't, like, reading the Gospel of John today, we don't have a clue. We, like, we're not familiar with the Targums, and, and so we, we totally miss all of this. Okay, the memra said, Behold, Adam, whom I have created. Did you notice that? So the memra created Adam. In, in the Targums, it was the memra, the word of God, who, who created Adam, is soul. And that Hebrew word there is Yahid. As I am soul, I am Yahid in the heavens above. We're going to encounter this a little bit later when it talks about Yeshua as the only, the only son, the only begotten son of God. That, that's that, that word, Yahid. So just take note of that. So the Memra created, created man and the Memra was the only one in heaven. Let's continue here. All right. Okay, this is Genesis 11. All the inhabitants of the earth were of one language and of one speech and one counsel. I like this. They spake the holy language, the Lashona Kodesh, by which the world was created at the beginning. That's a common belief. Um, that's always been the Jewish belief that Hebrew was the original language. Um, while their hearts erred afterwards from the word. So eventually, people, people began to stray from the Memra. All right. Abraham believed in the Lord and had faith in the Memra. And he reckoned it to him for righteousness. He believed in the Memra. In the word of God. And that's what was reckoned to him for righteousness. Does that give you a better understanding of John and Paul when they talk about justification by what? By faith, just like Abraham. Believing in the Memra, who was always there with God and was God. Okay, and here, now we have the Lord speaking with his Memra. So the Lord is talking with his Memra, saying, Shall I hide from Abraham, my friend, what I'm about to do? This is in the Sodom and Gomorrah story. All right, continuing on. This, this, this is when you can definitely see there is some serious um, exposition, exposition going on. Um, Abraham planted a paradise in Beersheba. All right, some people were there. They, uh, they ate and drank with him. He, he didn't let them pay for the food, but he did teach them that the world was by 
by God's Memra. And then he told them, Pray before your Father who is in heaven. Okay, so he made them proselytes. And uh, he converted them to uh, believing in the, in the one God. Okay, and then Abraham praised and prayed there in the name of the word of the Lord. So Abraham prayed in the name of the Memra. <laughs> the Memra who, according to John, later became flesh and um, etc. All right. Um, Jacob, the story of Jacob running away from home. Um, and then it, this is interesting. So remember, remember Jacob's, Jacob's ladder that he had at uh, Beit El? That's what he named the place. The sun was hidden from before its time because the Memra had desired to speak with him. So the, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was was God, and the Word um, wanted to speak with Jacob. Okay, so Jacob prays later. You know, if if God will bring me, if if God will bring me again in peace to my father's house, the Memra shall be my God. All the Jews read the stuff and believed the stuff. It was the Memra, the word of the Lord, who remembered Rachel and his good compassions. And the word of the Lord, the Memra, heard the voice of her prayer. The end of Genesis. God says, I am he who in my word, so in my Memra, will go down with you into you to Egypt. And my word, my Memra, shall bring thee up from thence. So my word's going to bring you guys back up from Egypt. All right, book of Exodus. It was the Memra, the word of the Lord, who spoke to Moses. He who spake to the world, be and it was. And he who will speak to it, be and it will be. So here's the Memra speaking to the world, and it was. So you can see the Memra was there present in the creation of the world, when the world was spoken into being by God. The Lord was revealed in his Memra, and to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as the God of heaven. But the name of the Memra wasn't known to them. Now that's interesting. So there was this Jewish belief that you, that you could that you could encounter the Memra, you could encounter the Word of God as a person, but it didn't didn't mean that you necessarily knew what the name of the Memra was. Hmm. Could it be that that's still true today? Okay, the, the Memra, the Word of the Lord conducted the people by the way of the desert. Okay, so it was the Memra that led them out of Egypt. Next page. The Memra speaks to Moses. How long are you going to stand here praying before me? I am the Lord who heals you by my Memra, my word. Moses led the people out of the camp to meet the word of the Lord, to meet the Memra at Mount Sinai. At the beginning of the Ten Commandments, it was the Memra, it was the, the, the word of the Lord who spoke all the excellency of these words. So God, it was, it, was, it was the word of God who spoke the Ten Commandments. It was God who spoke through his Memra, the Ten Commandments. He goes on to say, There I will appoint my Memra, my word to me with the sons of Israel. Shabbat is a sign between my Memra and you, the people of Israel. A sign of, between you, my word and you. A couple instances in Leviticus. This is how the book opens. Then did the word of the Lord... So the Memra called unto Moses, and the Memra spoke with him from the tabernacle. Towards the end of the book, the glory of my Shekhinah. So that's how you say that word in Hebrew. So the verb Shekhan means to, it's like where you live, where you dwell, where you make your home. So the glory of my Shekhinah. And uh, th it's actually really fascinating to see, this is a theme that runs through at the Targums, the God's Shekhinah. So his, uh, like his, his, his manifest presence, where, where he, he makes his, his glorious home in a special way. Um, so the glory of my Shekhinah shall dwell among you, and my Memra shall be to you for a redeeming God. So the Memra is a redeeming God. All right. Numbers. Now, again, I, I'm not saying, I'm not, I'm, notice here, I'm not saying that all of this is like theologically correct or not. I'm simply pointing out to you that this is the tar these are the targums that were read by the Jewish people in the Second Temple era and, and thereafter, um, roughly when, when John wrote his gospel. And he said, in the beginning was the Memra, and the Memra was with God, and the Memra was God, and the Memra became flesh. Right? Um, so here's Moshe. Uh, you, if, you, if you've been to synagogue, you probably know this tune. 
da 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 right so he says arise now word of the lord so memra similarly okay this is great the the bronze serpent the bronze serpent if if anyone beholds it then shall he live if his heart be directed to the name of the word of the Lord. So if anyone is, one is bitten by the snake and they lift their eyes to the bronze serpent and they direct their hearts to the Memra, they'll be healed. Why is that interesting? Because what did Yeshua say? Remember in the Gospel of Yochanan, John chapter 3, he compared himself to the bronze serpent. All right, Do, let's move on to Deuteronomy. Behold, the word, the Memra, has shown us his glorious Shechina, his presence and the greatness of his excellency, and the voice of his word, the voice of his memra, have we heard out of the midst of the fire. This day have we seen that the Lord speaketh, speaketh with a man in whom is the Holy Spirit, the Ruach HaKodesh, and he remained alive. That's another theme that runs through the Targums, the, the theme of the Shekhinah, God's presence, and this, the theme of the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit. You actually only see that term Holy Spirit used once in the, um, in the Hebrew Bible where David says, take not um, thy, thy Holy Spirit from me, um, thy Ruach Kod is how it's, how it's said there. Other than that, it doesn't actually use that term, um, but it's used throughout the Targums, and uh, that gives us a better understanding of how it's used in the, uh, the teachings of Yeshua and his disciples also. All right, the prophecy about the, the, the prophet like Moses who would come. In whom shall be the Holy Spirit as in thee, Moses, and I will put my memra of prophecy in his mouth. All right. The uh, the word of the Lord, so the the memra be, the becometh the king over you for his name's sake, as over a people beloved as a treasure. So the memra becomes the king of Israel. In uh, towards the end of the book of Deuteronomy, so the memra will hide the ruach hakodesh, the Holy Spirit, from you when the plagues come upon you and your children. So these are the curses in the book of Deuteronomy. It's the memra who's hiding the Holy Spirit. Interesting. So there's this connection between the word of God and the spirit of God. And this is in the Targums. This isn't the New Testament. This is traditional Jewish literature. Though you may be dispersed unto the ends of the earth, from thence will the Memra gather you together by the hand of Elijah, the great priest. And from thence will he bring you by the hand of the Melech HaMashiach, the King Messiah. Woo! That's powerful. So it's the Memra gathering you through, um, through uh, Elijah, the prophet, and, and, and bringing you back through the the anointed the anointed king, the the Melech Mashiach. All right, last page. I'll show you a couple more instances here. Um, by his word, by his memra, he will make atonement for his land and for his people. In the beginning was the memra, and the memra was with God, and the memra was God. And the Targum say that the memra would make atonement for the land of Israel, and for God's people. And then finally, I'd mentioned to you that there's also not just the uh, Targum Onkelos on the Torah, there's also Targum Jonathan on the prophets. And this is one instance of that. Behold my servant, the Messiah, whom I bring, my chosen one in whom, in whom one delights. So it doesn't actually say the Messiah, like in the Hebrew text. That's, that's, in, that's an expounding of the text. The, this is the Mashiach. As for my word, I will put my Holy Spirit upon him. He shall reveal my judgment unto the nations. So that's as for my memra. I'm going to put my Holy Spirit on my memra, on my word. So again, you see this connection of the Spirit and the word going together hand in hand. And yes, um, in the Isaiah 53 passage at the beginning, um, the Targums do state really quite clearly that that was the Messiah. So there was a belief 2,000 years ago. It was a common Jewish belief that Isaiah 53 um, was about was about the Mashiach. That's just, you know, it's that's one of those things they don't tell you now. They'll say, oh, Isaiah 53, that's not about the Messiah. That was never about the Messiah. That's not a Jewish belief. It's like, that's a lie. That's intellectual dishonesty to say that. Um, but that doesn't stop some people from who have been sucked into Christian Jewish polemics from saying that. All right, so um, just so you know, like in our in our going through the Gospel of John, we're not going to be moving this slowly through the verses. It's just like these opening lines are so 
they're so powerful if you read them in in context in the context of the targums from 2000 years ago that I'm you know I'm taking my I'm taking my time with them and I'm sure you can appreciate that we're not we didn't just read through like the 123 pages we only looked through like five or six and I left some space between those and I didn't even show you all of the different targums I just showed you like um an, an instance of one of the one of them so maybe you love me for that maybe you hate me but you know if you hate me listen you know you you do have that link and you can you can look through all those yourself all right and maybe maybe some of you will become like targum scholars and you can you can read through all the targums and see all the places where god's shina and his ruach kodesh you know his his presence and his spirit and also his memory his word are mentioned and uh maybe you can you can tell us more about that i i think that would be absolutely delightful all right so let us go back now oh um I'll just show this to you in brief here. So we're actually reading, we're we're reading from this is the this is the Delitz translation, and you can actually get this on um, on the website at holylanguage.com. Um, here it is, holylanguage.com, Delitz, and if you just go to that link, then you can get the whole Delitz translation in this this very nice layout. Um, in our previous Hebrew verses studies in the Delitz translation, we were we were working off of um, this here, and this is nice. It's like it's it's an actual copy of like one of the the early Delich editions. And you know, if if you studied through some of those with me, then you'll remember how we would zoom in like this. But at the same time, it's not as crisp, and uh, it's 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 not as readable. So I I've made the decision this time to not read from this text, even though it does have a higher degree of nostalgia for me for sure. And instead, to uh, to read from uh, this this crisper version on the website. So I, I hope you, I do hope you don't mind. And uh, all right, so let's. Uh, sorry, I just want. I'm just going to close this up here. Try to try to keep the uh, keep the clutter down, so to speak. Okay, that's. Uh, I think I have so many things open here that it's it's responding a little slower than usual. All right, so having said that, let's go back to our Hebrew text. (laughs) And uh, Mazel Tov to us. We made it through, what was that? Two verses. Yay, for us. All right. That was pretty powerful, though. Like, did that have any spiritual smash to it? I know it did for, I I, I know it it did, it did for me in my experience. All right, verse three. Hakol. So that's the all, everything. Nehia. Like, it became, it came into being. All. On Yado, so on his yod, his hand. We don't really use that expression in, in English, do we? But you know, on your hand means like um, through your power or um, through through your age through the agency of. It's kind of like that. So everything everything came into being through him, through his power, through, through the agency of him, of the uh, through the agency of the memra. And as you as you just saw in the Targums, that actually wasn't a new idea at all to the Jewish people a couple thousand years ago. That was a common belief that everything came into being through the Word of God. And um, I'll show you something uh, pretty nifty. Let's just finish this verse. Ume baladav. So and uh, and apart from him, lo nehya um, didn't come into being. Kol so. Everything, a shell which Nehia came into being, so everything came into being through um, through him, and apart from him, nothing came into being that's come into being. And uh, I want to show you an echo of this belief from the the uh, the, the targums in the Siddur, the uh, the Jewish prayer book. So this is this is the one that I most commonly use. And yes, there's a link to this and other. Um, Siddurim prayer books in the resources uh, part of the website. So I'll show you a little section here. We have blessings. Look at the top there. Blessings over food, drink, and fragrance. Some really nice blessings in here. And uh, you know, again, um, the, some of these are very old, and uh, were definitely spoken. They were they were they were spoken from the holy mouth of our master himself, and also his followers. For instance, before eating bread. He would say, you know, who brings forth bread from the earth, hamotzi lechem in that's in here. Now, the one specifically that I want to point out to you 
is where it says before eating or drinking any other foods. So there's some special like blessings for, you know, if you before bread, um, you know, um, and other things, if there's like fruit that came from a tree or fruit that came from the ground, there, there are special blessings for that. And then if, if it doesn't fall into any of those other categories, then there's this pan blessing that just covers everything else. And uh, this is how it goes. So uh, all the Jewish blessings begin the same way, of course. Blessed are you, Lord of God, King of the universe. Sheha kol nehiyah bidvaro. So sheha kol. So you hear hakol there. Here, you know what? Let's just uh, let's let's bring it back to the text here. So sheha kol, that's um, everything, like in the Gospel of John here. Nehia, so came into being. Bidvaro, so be in dvaro, his dvar, his what? His word. By whose word everything came into being. So there's a, there's a very clear parallel between uh, this blessing, you know, blessing God for everything that we uh, that we that we eat that qualifies as food and uh, the opening lines in the gospel of john and uh, that is one of the reasons i uh, i love the jewish tradition of prayer is uh, i encounter mashiach through that and uh, little blessings like that saying that blessing before you eat is definitely a reminder of uh, of the word of god and uh, how the world was was created through him and uh, how he's uh He's also the Aleph and Tav. He's he's with us today and with us now. All right. Now, there's this idea that there, there's this connection between the, the this this word of God, the Memra, and then uh, Yeshua of Nazareth. That's that's. For some people, that's a pretty big stretch. It's like, okay, I understand this like big cosmic concept, you know, the the word of God. What about um? Wh- and then there's this this human Yeshua. Like, uh, for some people, that's that's a hard connection to make, right? Um, or or even the idea that Yeshua, you know, as a human, was was also somehow also somehow existed before he was born. You know, he somehow went from this like spiritual entity to like a teeny tiny baby. For some people, that's a big stretch, and I'm going to show you a couple of uh, a couple of traditional passages, um, like from from Jewish literature, that talks about the belief that Messiah has been around for a really long time, and that he was actually around like when the world was made. Um, I, before we do that, I want to I want to share with you a couple uh, a couple of passages about the Memra, and uh, this is from John Lightfoot. So you know this this stuff about the Memra is. It's nothing new. John Lightfoot talked about it in his commentary. And uh, yeah, I'll show you the page there at the top of the page. He gives a couple instances of the Memra. And then I, I, what I'm going to read to you now is this part right there. Because he, he explains a little bit more about the Memra and how that word was used in the Aramaic language. And uh, if you ask me, this just makes it more meaningful. Though this must also be confessed, that the word memra doth sometimes signify nothing else, but... Okay, so this is what else memra can mean. I, thou, he. And is frequently applied to men too. All right. What does that mean? All right, let's, let's, let's read a couple instances and, and, and it'll, it'll be self-explanatory. Okay, so in the book of Job, for instance, he says... You're, I'm just going to paraphrase. Instead of saying thine eyes, I'm going to say your, okay? Your eyes are upon me. The Targum says, Einecha, so your eyes, Bememri, they're upon my my memra. All right? So it's it's kind of like, it's like, this is an instance of like, instead of saying me, you would say my memra. So instead of saying your eyes are upon me, you'd say my your eyes are upon my memra, my word. Hmm. All right, also in Job, he says, my breath is in me. And that phrase is nishmati, so my, my nishama. Uh, bememri is in my memra. So I, literally, it's like my breath is in my word. My breath is in me. So when you're talking about yourself, you will sometimes talk about your word and you'll use those, you'll use those terms interchangeably because your word is yourself and you are your word. Whoa. In Second Chronicles, there is a league between me and you. In the Targum, that is a kayama, uh, bain memri, so between me, between my memra, uvein memracha, and between your memra. 
sort of say there's a there's a there's this distance between us. You say there's there's a distance between my memory and your memory, between our words, so to speak. Um, a little later on, he made a covenant between him and between all the people and between the king. So Kayam, so covenant Bain between Mem Memriah between uh, between his word Uvain Kol Ama and between all the people Uvain and between Memra de Malka and between the Memra the word of the Malka the king. All right, so that's um so that's interesting because it's referring to multiple parties there, and in each case instead of referring to them directly, it refers to their Memra, their word. He goes on to say, L Lightfoot says, I observe that in Zechariah, the Targumist renders Barucho by his spirit as Memriah, by his Memra. Hmm. If at least that main strictness be so rendered. For by what has been just alleged, it seems that Bememriah may be translated the Lord by himself or the Lord himself. So if, if it says like, um, you know, the word of the Lord, what it's saying is the Lord himself. Isn't that interesting? So there's this connection that the Lord's word was the Lord himself. In the beginning was the Lord's word, and the Lord's word was with the Lord, and the Lord's word was the Lord. So it's it's interesting that that throughout the Targums this is used not just in reference to God's word, but in reference to your word and, and my word, so to speak. All right. So anyways, that's that's worth noting, that this is a concept that wasn't just applied to God and his word. This is a concept that was applied to humans and, uh, and their word, so to speak. So, now that my word has said that, um, why, why don't we allow y your word and my word to continue on in this study session, um, our words together? All right, so that's kind of what it would sound like. And again, like this is, this is a figure of speech. This is, this is like a, a, a linguistic device, so to speak, that we just don't have in English. Um, so, it's it's probably a little bit so you know again it's it it, it takes a lot to wrap our uh, our minds around that or maybe I should say it takes a lot to wrap the word of our minds around that but you know maybe 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 play with that and see if if it doesn't begin to sink in okay so having having pointed that out to you let's now look at a uh, a couple um, ancient Jewish texts that talk about the uh, shall we say the pre-existence of the Messiah. All right, so firstly, Micah chapter 5, verse 1. This is how it reads in Targum Jonathan. Now, it doesn't explicitly mention the Mashiach in this text, but in this Targum, it does indeed explicitly state Mashiacha, which, of course, is the Aramaic equivalent of Mashiach, the Anointed One. And it goes on to say at the end here, Meyome Alma. Kind of sounds like a, an expression in the Kaddish prayer if you're familiar with that. So Meyome is from days of Alma, of um, like the, the Olam, like the world, the universe, forever, eternity, all of that. All right. So anybody who says, oh, Micah 5 verse 1, you know, talking about, um, about you know, Beit Lechem Ephrata, see it says right here. You know, connecting um, Bethlehem with the Messiah. That's not a Jewish belief. It's not what it's talking about. It's like, no, that's not true. Actually, in the tar Targum Yonatan, which is, you know, it, it's, it's the official Targum, um, there is a connection made between Bethlehem, Beit Lechem, and the Mashiach, as you can see here. All right. Now, here's here's a passage. This is called a Baraisa. So it's like this, um, it's like this, this passage that, um, that, uh, that was brought in from an outside source and then was then codified in the um, in, in the Talmud. And this is so this Bryce is mentioned in both Netarim 39b and also Pesachim 54a. And maybe the fact that I just mentioned the Talmud is freaking you out. And you're like, oh no, I've heard there are bad things in the Talmud. The Talmud is basically like the Wikipedia of of Judaism. And I don't know if you've read Wikipedia, but there's some bad things in Wikipedia. Um, but we, we use Wikipedia because it's a historical source, because it gives us information. And that's the way it is with the Talmud too. No, the Talmud isn't the Bible. No, the Talmud isn't the authoritative word of God. Yes, there's some really weird things in there, but most of it is uh, not weird. Most of it's just really boring. Most people would, would find most of it to just be really boring. It's like all of these, like this, this, this legal nitty gritty of um, the fine points of, of keeping the law. Um, yeah, so 
yeah, most people who are like, oh, the Talmud, it's bad. I wouldn't touch the Talmud. Uh, my question is, well, how much of the Talmud have you actually read? And for most people, it's like less than 1% of 1%. Um, at this point in my own studies, I am about halfway through the Talmud. I, I follow the Doth Yomi, the Daily Page of Talmud program. It takes seven and a half years doing a page a day to make it through. And I'm about halfway through. And yeah, there's some weird things in there. But like I said, most of it's just boring and very not dangerous. And um, and then there's also some some really rich stuff too. And definitely things that that cast light on the Jewish world of Yeshua and his disciples in the New Testament. All right. So with that little disclaimer, here's the passage from the Talmud. So just because we, we re reference the Talmud occasionally as a historical source doesn't mean that we're, we're preaching it as the word of God. And it doesn't mean that, that you are now a Jew. I'm not trying to make you a Jew if you're, if you're non-Jewish. All right. So anyways, just be secure in who you are. Don't feel threatened. All right. Okay. So, so Tana, I was taught uh, Shiva, seven Devarim, things. So it's like, you know, a Devar is like a word or a thing, right? So that's interesting too. We're like a Devar is a word or a thing. So seven words, seven things. Uh, Nivra'u, so they were Barad, they were created. Uh, Kodem, so before, you know, preceding. Shanivra, so before it was Barad, before it was created. How long? The world. All right, so there were, there were seven things that were created before the world for the creation of the world. Eluhain, these are them. Torah, right, so the Torah is one of them. Utshuva, what's that? That's repentance. And it, like, these are these are big concepts. And, and there there's some lengthy, rather metaphysical and, and also philosophical conversations that go into why it's believed that these things were like, these were things before the world was a thing, basically. And, um, we're not going to go into all of that here, but like, for instance, chuva, repentance. Well, that would be related to free choice. So, you know, free, the, free choice was a thing before the universe was 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 structured. Uh, that would kind of be a, like, again, it's very philosophical, right? And we're not getting to get, we're not going to get into all that right now. Okay, so Gan Eden, so that's the Garden of Eden. In other words, paradise, Vigay Hinnom, and, uh, and, you know, well, Gehinnom, I know, Gehenna, like, roughly speaking, the opposite of paradise. Um, Kisei HaKavod. So that's the throne of glory, Uve Tamikdash, and the temple, which is interesting because, you know, the book of Hebrews, for instance, teaches that there is a heavenly temple, um, which preceded the earthly temple. And the last one, Ushmo, and the name shell of Mashiach, and the name of the Messiah, was created before the world began. All right. So these, these are fascinating. Like, if you actually get into these, we're not going to do that right now. Um, in the... Um, the Midrashic commentary on the book of Breshit or Genesis, so in Breshit's Rabbah, it um, it says this. It explain it gives a little bit of the background to this. So Shmo, the name Shell of Mashiach, Menain, from where? Shenamar, as it said in Tehillim, that's Psalms, um Ein Vav, so that's seventy two, Yud Zain, so that's seventeen, Hihi, so will be Shmo his name Leolam. Forever. So his name will be forever. That's understood as being a reference to the name of the Mashiach, which is Leolam, forever, which of course doesn't just entail future forever, but fa past forever. Therefore, the name of the Messiah, um, it, it pre-exists to the, um, the creation of the world. It, it, the name of the Messiah was there before Genesis 1-1. And as you probably know, in Hebrew, your name it doesn't just stand for your name, it stands for you and who you are. All right. Um, here is some Midrashic commentary on the book of Vaikra or uh, Leviticus. So in Vaikra Rabbah 14, um, it has a little bit of commentary on Genesis chapter 1, verse 3. Veruach Elohim. And the Spirit of God, Merachephet, was. Uh, oh, that's a hard one. Was brooding all on Panea Mine. So the, the, the surface of the waters. Za, this, Rucho. So it's the Ruach, it's the spirit shell of Melech, HaMashiach. So it's the spirit of the, um, the I love this expression, the Melech HaMashiach. And it's, uh, you can translate this in different ways. Because remember, Mashiach means anointed. So I mean, most simply, it means the anointed king. The Melech HaMashiach is the anointed king. But of course, you know, it, it doesn't just mean any anointed king. It means the anointed king. It means the... 
like the messianic king, the king messiah. See, they're the, the, the kingly messiah. So there are always different ways that you can phrase it in English. Which is your favorite? You tell me what your favorite is. Um, I think a standard term in, in this a standard term in, in in Jewish lingo would just be to say like the king messiah. Right? So kind of interesting. The spirit of God is the spirit of the Messiah. There's the spirit of God in the uh, Gen- the uh, first in Genesis chapter one in the creation story, and that is the spirit of the Melech Mashiach, the King Messiah. Hmm. Now, do we have a similar thought in the writings of Yeshua's disciples and in the history of the early Yeshua movement? Absolutely. Um, so you know, there's there's for w- one example would be um, Luke. In the Ma'ase Hashlichim, so the you know the acts of of, of Yeshua's emissaries, um, there's this point in the story where he says, and then we were we were going to go across to this country, but the spirit of Jesus wouldn't let us. Basically, the spirit of Yeshua. Who's that? That's the spirit of the Melech Hamashiach. Who's that? That's the spirit of God who was there in the beginning, creating the world. So it's not just in the the midrash that we see this connection between the spirit of God and the spirit of the Messiah. Um, who was around from the beginning? We also we also see this in traditional Jewish literature. All right, one more, just one more. All right, so this is um, Echa Rabbah. So if it says Rabbah, that means it's the midrash. It's the midrashic commentary on the um, the Hebrew scriptures, and Echa is the book of Lamentations. All right, so and it says this, Ma Shemo. So what's the name shell of Melech Hamashiach, of the of the um, the King Messiah, Rabbi, Rabbi Abba, that's the guy's name, Abba, nice name, Bal Kahana, so Rabbi Abba Bar Kahana, Amar he said Hashem Shemo, so he said so this little hey with the like little yud, that that's short for like the tetragrammaton, you know the the, the four letter name of Hebrew name of God, so Rabbi Abba Bar Kahana says. The name of the Messiah is the name of God, Hashem. Shneemar, as it said, and so this is in Yirmiya, Jeremiah, um, Kaf Gimel, so 23, Vav, verse 6, Vizah, and this Shmo is his name, Ashel, which Yikro, um, by, by which it will be called, Hashem Tzidkenu. So, God, our, the Lord is our righteousness, is I guess how that's translated in English. The Lord our righteousness. So, Rabbi Abba Bar Kahana said, well, you know, according to this verse, um, the name of the Messiah is going to be Hashem, <laughs> which is um, kind of a big deal to say that. All right. So let's get back to our text here. So those are some traditional texts in Judaism that talk about Mashiach, you know, the name of the Mashiach, Mashiach being around before the world began that talk about the, the the spirit of god being the spirit of the mashiach and they talk about the name of god being the name of the mashiach so it, it almost sounds like this gospel saying stuff like in the beginning was the memra and the memra was with god and the memra was god and he, you know through him everything was created so you can see that um the gospel of john was actually very Jewish. And there's nothing that he said here that wasn't generally believed by Jewish people. Yochanan just took all of these big concepts that were floating around out there, and he said, and that happened. And his name was Yeshua, and we met him. And like we actually touched him with our hands, and we followed him around. And um, and then, you know, and, and he died, and he came back to life, and, and then he, he sent us. So, you know, there was nothing, there was not, there, so as you can see, there's nothing so far in the, the opening verses in the Gospel of John that's not Jewish. Or at least, you know, that wasn't Jewish as, as Jewish people believed 2,000 years ago. You know, Judaism today is a different story. It's, it's defined itself in reaction to Christian claims, which, you know, to some degree is very understandable. But it also means that Judaism has, um, it's not what it used to be in some ways. All right. But, you know, those texts are still there. They're still in the Targums. They're still in the Midrash. They're still in the Talmud. They just don't get as much attention or they're they're either ignored or explained away in one way or another often. All right. Let's keep reading. Verse 4. Bo in him. Hayu 
was Chaim, life. There was life in him. You know the classic Jewish toast, right? Lechaim to life. Well, that can be, uh, for a disciple of Yeshua, that can be an acknowledgement of the Messiah. And the Chaim, the life that, that was in the Word of God and that we can experience in the Word of God also. Vehachaim and the life Hayu uh, was or became all light. Levne Haadam. So, in other words, to humanity, to uh, to the Bnei, the sons of Haadam, um, you know, the original, the original human, the sons of Adam, and of course, this is the the children of of Adam and Eve, of Adam and Chav in general. I um, just as a, as a, as a side note here, you remember that there are there there are spiritual entities out there that are evil, and uh, they're also tricksters. So they they try to deceive humans, and one of the ways they do that is uh, they're really great at like pretending to be something or someone they're not, and one of the ways they do that is by uh, you know they're, they're they're dark beings, and they're forces of darkness, but they present themselves as messengers of light. That's one of the things that scripture says. And this is one of the ways you can tell if, if that's happening. Let's say that you're encountering some kind of spiritual energy or um, a message from a person or a group of people. Um, and it's claiming to be like a message of light or a messenger of light or something like that. Notice here that in him, so in him, in the word of God was light, was life, and it's that life that was the light of the light of men. So the true light is warm. The true light, it's it, it's like shining from life itself. So it's alive and it's life giving. So the true light isn't cold. The true light isn't going to like suck the life out of you, drain you that way necessarily. Sometimes you'll encounter the light of God and it will it will shine on things in your heart and you will be like, hmm, and it'll be humbling. And there may be some like turning to do, turning from those things, turning to to the God who is the source of the true light, you know? And I mean, so that can be a little bit draining, but but that's one of the ways to discern between the true light or not. The true light is the light of life. Reading on. Vehaol and the light. Heil. So it shines. It illuminates. Bechoshach. In the darkness. And uh, this is a theme from the creation story, by the way. There was light, there was darkness, and uh, Elohim separated between the or, the light, and the choshach, the darkness. And obviously it wasn't just talking about physical light and darkness there because he hadn't created the sun, the moon, and the stars at that point. So he was talking about spiritual realities. And uh, I, I believe also moral realities, ethical realities. Okay. V'hachoshach, in the darkness, lo hisigo. So the darkness, lo hisigo. It didn't, uh, this word here. Um, now this is interesting because if you if you see how this word is used in the Torah or in stories in the Hebrew Scriptures, it's usually used like if you're chasing somebody and then you catch them or you you catch up to them, you overtake them. That's the word. The darkness didn't overtake the light. It didn't catch up to the light, so to speak. Um, let's have a look at the um, the Greek of this text and uh, just see why Professor Delitz used this word. And uh, and also see like what in the world that means and if there's any uh, any legitimacy to that. All right, so here we have Esword, and um, here I have a whole bunch of different translations um, lined up. You can have this one, which is just the text itself. Then you have the the plus version, which has the Strong's numbers. You have to pay for this, but you can get the KJV with um, the KJV with the Strong's numbers for free. So, of course, I go into that in greater detail in the eSword course. I'm not going to explain how to do everything here. I'm, instead of showing, telling you how to do the things, I'm just going to do the things, okay? All right, so let's go to uh, to John chapter 1, verse 5. And uh, so we're going to click on this verse here. 
and then we're going to hit our compare tab right here and it's gonna it's gonna show how this verse is rendered in all these different versions okay so some of these of course are more literal and then some are so not so literal okay so um, there are a couple in here that are very literal for instance the uh, the ABP interestingly enough it says here the darkness did not what didn't it didn't uh, overtake it so that that's the exact Hebrew word that professor Delich used and then um, there there are some of these that are okay several of these that are more literal use the word comprehend which I honestly don't comprehend why that word is used it's not the most literal um, and then the other the other kind of sense given is like overcoming it suppressing extinguishing overcoming overpowering all right so you can like almost every single version here renders this differently like wh what's with that what's going on so tell you what let's have a look at how this word is used throughout the New Testament and that will give us a better sense of what this word means all right so we're gonna go to this uh, word Ooh, that's a big one Catalambano or Bano Catalambano and we're gonna right click and we're gonna do a quick search on it and we're gonna see every place that it's used in the New Testament if I click entire Bible it'll, it'll show the same thing because this is of course it's just showing the Greek the Greek New Testament all right here she comes and here it is all right so let's have a look at this all right so the first time this word is used as you can see here is in mark and it's used in reference to like this epileptic kid who is having these these seizures that in this case were apparently um, caused by a demon and it says it seizes him and it, there's the word used all right so seized him so the darkness it, the darkness doesn't seize the light all right that's that's the only place it's used in the gospels and then the next place is here in, in john all right, next place it's used in John, a woman caught in adultery. So the darkness can't catch the light. Again, it's, it's that sense of, you know, catching up to or overtaking, catching the light. That's interesting. Um, okay, here this word is actually translated. So, oh, that's interesting. So Yeshua says, um, a little while longer the light is among you. Walk while you have the light so that the darkness won't, it won't overtake you. It won't catch up to you. All right, so there... That word is translated. So that's that's kind of weird, honestly. You have the same word in the same gospel in the NESB anyways. In one place, they translate that as comprehend. And in another place, they translate that as overtake. Those are not exactly the same meanings. Um, interesting. Okay, so here in Acts, we see that this word can have the sense of understand. They observed the confidence of Peter and John and understood that they were uneducated and untrained men. All right, so... So it can have the sense of understanding. Okay, same with Acts chapter 10. Peter says, I most certainly understand now that God isn't one. All right, so can you, this is fun. Can you see what we're doing here? We're kind of like, we're basically, we're, we're tracing the mental paths of the translators to be like, why did you guys pick this word? All right, let's look at how it's used throughout scripture. Okay, well, now we can begin to understand here that... Okay, look at this. Gentiles who didn't pursue righteousness attained righteousness. Again, it's like they caught up to it. That you may be able to comprehend with all the saints. Okay, Paul was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. Okay, the the day would overtake you like a thief. All right, all right. So, anyways, we I think we get the idea here. So, all right. So now let's let's just go back to our Hebrew text here. Um, I think you can, now we have a better understanding of why Franz Delitz chose this Hebrew word to, uh, to represent this, this concept. So in the Greek there, you can see that it was used roughly in one of two ways. It was used in the sense of if you're like chasing somebody and then you, you overtake them or you catch up to them. And then it's also used in the sense of, um, you know, kind of more figuratively, if mentally speaking, you catch up to an idea and therefore you understand it or comprehend it. All right. Now, having said that, what do you think, what do you think is the better word to translate? If you were to translate the New Testament, would you say, what's, what's better to say the darkness, the darkness doesn't understand the light or the darkness, it can't, it can't overtake the light. Hmm. You know, I will share this. Um, you know what that reminds me of is uh, in the DC Comics mythology, shall we say, 
reminds me of Barry Allen, who's the who's the Flash, because he moves at light speed and nothing and nobody can catch up to him. Why? Because he moves at the speed of light, which is kind of interesting because it's talking here about light, how like in the word of God was life and that life was the light of people and uh, the light shines in the darkness and the darkness can't catch up to it. It almost sounds like something straight out of the flash, honestly. Like this person who moves at light speed and therefore nothing and no one can can catch him. Mm, interesting. All right. You know what? <laughs> on that profound note, <laughs> that uh, that correlation with uh, DC mythology, why don't we wrap up um, this first study, or first Hebrew verses study, reading through the first, what is this, the first five verses in the Gospel of of the Okanon, John. Thanks for joining me today. Um, I hope lots of things. I hope, I hope this, I hope this time together brought your heart to life in any way. I hope you feel like you've you've truly encountered Yeshua of Nazareth for yourself in a way that you never have before. I hope that. You've understood the writings of his disciples more profoundly than you ever have before. I hope your faith is strengthened. Um, I hope that together, as we've been basking in the light of the Messiah, so to speak, I, I hope that we've become a little bit more like him. And I, I hope that we've become a little bit shinier so that we can go shine his light on other people. All right. Can't wait to have you join me in, uh, in our second Hebrew verses study in uh, the Besorah of Yochanan.